have 40 chairs just in case, but I was thinking big, you know, so who knows, maybe others will trickle in. So thank you all for coming. You all know what I, why we are here, right? To conserve uh, water and also enhance, you know, the look and feel of this uh, community. So uh, you've heard me speak about this many times before, so I don't need to go on. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, the staff from Sustainable Solano. This is Allison Nagel. Allison is the uh, Workforce Development and Communications Manager over there. I got that right. And then this is the Permaculture Sustainable Landscaping Designer, I guess, Michael Wedgley. So they're going to be taking over and giving the presentation. So I guess we're going to do whatever, maybe a half hour or so of the presentation and then leave a lot of time for a Q&A. Okay? Yep. All right, thank you. So, um, yeah, real quick, um, I'm Allison Nagel with Sustainable Solano. We've been around for a little over 20 years, started here in Benicia with the community garden, it's grown throughout Solano County. Um, a lot of our work focuses on sustainable landscaping, um, as well as connecting people with local food um, and education. So. We're really excited to be working with Michael, um, having him design for this project. Um, and a lot of the techniques and things he will be talking about are things that can be done for a larger um, you know, location or can be done in your own backyard. So we're um, you know, hopeful he can give you some things you can be thinking about at your own homes as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you everybody for coming out. Um, First off, just to let you guys know, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm going to try to project, but if I if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Michael. Um, I'm a permaculture designer, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about what permaculture is. Um, also, a water harvesting designer, soil food web certified lab technician, and uh, I also started a nonprofit in Contra Costa County just trying to... Uh, organized neighborhoods and communities around installing food forests in people's backyards, uh, trying to create like more resilient neighborhoods, uh, provide better quality food to uh, people in the community. Um, and then I'm also a, uh, what's it called, a designer and consultant for like freelance. So if, you know, anybody needs any kind of designs for the backyards, I kind of do that kind of stuff too. So, permaculture. Is anybody familiar with permaculture? We've heard the name. Okay, so basically permaculture, it's in here, it's an approach to land management that adopts um, arrangements observed in flourishing natural ecosystems. It includes a set of design principles derived using whole systems thinking, and it uses these principles in fields such as regenerative agriculture, rewilding, and community resilience. So I actually have, um, I'm gonna pass this around. These um, are the ethics here for permaculture, which is earth care, people care, fair share, and then a number of principles that we use to design landscapes. Just to pass that around. And permaculture is what I use to basically design the system. Um, it's a natural system that uses like different types of guilds and things like that um, to create permanence within the system. To give you an example, we have like a guild here. This is elderberry tree. And we have uh, lupine, which is a uh, shrub that actually is nitrogen fixing. So it feeds the tree so you don't have to fertilize and things like that. So it's a very like natural, integrated, holistic system. Um, let me see here. Can, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, second? please. So uh, what he's showing right here is one of the initial sites for this new landscaping. Where we're standing at right now is going to be the initial site. And then um, up on Devonshire, if you've seen that rock formation, I think around 1772, oh, yeah. right there, that's going to be the other site next to mailboxes. So this one here that he's going to describe is here, and then he'll describe that one up there as well. So. Thank you. All right. Yeah, sorry, I'm feeling a little shaky from being sick, but. Um, yeah, so this is the site here. Um, you can see the sidewalk right here. Um, this design has that tree taken out and two new trees put in, both of them being native. 
So this particular tree here is um, bay laurel. I don't know if you guys are familiar with bay laurel. It smells really nice. Um, and then we also have, again, like I said earlier, the elderberry tree. The nice thing about the elderberry tree is it is a native. It has um, beautiful flowers that come out that like all kinds of pollinators love. And then it's a, it's a tree that I kind of incorporated because also there is berries you guys can go and harvest. Uh, they don't create a mess. The birds will eat them if you don't get to them. But you can make jams with them. You can make like tinctures and things that's really healing for like colds and stuff like that. So the point of this like is not to just be like landscaping. It's more to kind of be like naturescaping. It's meant to kind of invite you to be a part of it without inviting people to hang out in it because uh, that's one of the concerns being that this is like somebody's home. We don't want people hanging out around here like it's a park, but it does have like some integration so you can move through it and also participate with it if you'd like. Um, let's see, so let's see. So to give you guys kind of like an example again, also that integration and naturescaping as opposed to landscaping, I consider not just like aesthetics, like a typical landscaping might, I'm considering also all the senses. So smell, um, you know, aesthetics is considered as well. But along this um, area here, where you know people are gonna walk by a lot. There's a lot of salvias that have a lot of that sage smell coming out. There's lavenders in the other property. So I'm trying to engage like, you know, all of your senses to really give you a place of belonging and uh, being a part of the nature and the natural like landscape. Um, let's see. The other thing that we're doing on this too is we're also gonna be trying to do some rainwater catchment. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with rainwater catchment. Uh, but we're hoping to pull water off of the rooftop up here um, and then go underneath the ground, put some pipe in, and then that will like come out somewhere right around here. We'll have what's called like basins and they're dug out, uh, like done with earthworks, so they're dug out. So the water will come in here, it'll flow where it can then like seep in and sink in, move on into like another basin. Let's see here, we have four basins. So you can see it'll come on into this basin here, come over into this basin, which is right about like here-ish, and then move over into there. It's unlikely we'll get that much water, but if we do, um, it has a place to go and to seep into the ground. So this whole design, all these plants are very like low water usage. So it's unlikely that we'll have to, over like a year or two, we shouldn't have to actually do any kind of supplemental irrigation, hopefully. Because we only have the one roof, we don't get as much water as we do on that other site. I'll show you guys. So this is the other site, which is kind of like this spot over there with the mailboxes. What's nice about this one is that it's kind of, it's one that can be used as a template for all those spots that are kind of like that around the, the property. Um, but you can see that this one actually has two buildings here, I think just like that one does. And we can get a lot of water off of these two rooftops. And so it'll go into this basin that kind of is a circle around, uh, just like that one has a tree there. It would be a basin that goes around it, so all the water will flow into there. This, the basin's filled with wood chips, so it's not like you're gonna have like some big dish or something. You will have it nice and level still looking. Um, and the wood chips also act like a sponge and it'll release that water over time. And then around it you have a lot of different types of shrubs and herbaceous flowers, things like that. Again, you've got lavenders, which when you're you know coming out of your car and walking down the walkway, the lavenders should like smell nice, look pretty. So rainwater catchment's a big a big part of the designs. Even a little bit of rain, like I mean Yeah, a exactly. long way. So like in that other one, that other design that I just showed you guys, an inch will pretty much fill those basins. If we get an inch of rain, it'll fill those basins. So it's something that we'll want to consider probably putting some kind of diverter so that if it's if we're expecting like the rain that we got like a month ago, we can divert some of that rain back to the normal place it goes because it'll inundate that system because it just there's so much rain that comes off of those two rooftops. Whereas this one, we're only getting about one inch of rain gets us about 296 gallons of water. But um, these, all these plants are pretty much native. 
Um, so they're very like low water usage, so they should be okay. The cool thing about doing native plants too is that they work in harmony with um, the like native wildlife. Um, something that I learned in Tucson is that they have like the mesquite tree and there's mesquite trees that are in China, like all over the place. And they have some of those in Tucson as well. But what they found was like that the, the native mesquite trees flowered at just the right time for like the butterflies that were coming through and migrating so they could actually like provide support for those uh, butterflies, whereas like the non-native mesquites did not. So that's the importance of having like native plants so that we can provide kind of like a nice oasis for migrating uh, species. So that's what's nice about this spot is that it can be a little like hub and oasis for all kinds of native wildlife. Um, a lot of these plants will bring in, have been chosen also to bring in like hummingbirds and monarch butterflies. And so you can kind of think of this little spot as like a little teeny sanctuary on their path overhead. Um, we're really close to the marshes too. So, you know, it's just nice little like hip hop and skip over here for them. Um, okay. Huh. No, shotguns maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, uh, yeah, do you have do you have coyote problem? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Like are they getting chickens or something? Wow. Yeah, just bigger dogs. I don't know. They're hard, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh huh. Yeah, up here. Um, so this little area here, because milkweed isn't a very like attractive plant. Yeah, so I put that one um, like in this area here, in kind of like a little sanctuary. Um, it's milk. Yeah, it's a Sclepius uh, fascicularis, and it's a milkweed that they particularly like eat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so she'll pass around um, some images of the plants. Yeah, and again, these milkweeds are paired in guilds um, with this Lupinus albifrons, which is, you'll see pictures of it, but it's a really beautiful uh, purple flowering uh, plant, and it um, is nitrogen fixing, meaning it pulls nitrogen out of the atmosphere and then fixes it into the ground for all the other plants to use. Um, so all those kind of things go into consideration is how to like stack functions with different plants so that we don't have to have somebody out here fertilizing plants or doing pesticides and things like that. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, some things that I considered when doing the designs. Um, first off, like I said, more approaching it from a standpoint of like nature scaping as opposed to landscaping. Um, as I wrote here, you know, beauty is not just seen with our eyes, it's experienced by all of our senses. Uh, the designs are meant to evoke a connection in our subconscious that puts us at ease um, and gives us a sense of being a part of nature. It uh, goes beyond the sterile traditional landscaping and evokes life through nature scaping. Um, I did prioritize aesthetics because I know that was one of you guys' priorities is aesthetics. Um, I also focused on bringing nature into the landscape with the focus on butterflies and hummingbirds. Um, prioritize natives. Smell was considered. Mm -hmm. Uh, low water usage was prioritized. Um, again, small amounts of harvestable herbs. I was really taking her into consideration. She wanted some pomegranates, but um, the ones that I chose was uh, white sage. So white sage is, you know, used for like smudge sticks. If anybody's interested in that, so you come come and harvest and dry some for smudge sticks. Lavender, uh, yarrow is a medicinal herb. Black elderberry kind of talks a little bit about that. Silverberry is a is a berry that is um it's all right like it doesn't taste so bad but it's really like healthy for you too um, oregano everybody knows oregano uh, and thyme and then I also prioritize low maintenance um, the last thing on here is that uh, we also included like a biological plan so um, I also am what's called a soil food web consultant and so I look at uh, soil underneath the microscope and I see what is lacking as far as what would be in nature. Um, there's some uh, examples of the types of microbes that I hope to see. Um, amoeba, which is a type of protozoa. Uh, nematodes, which are basically like microscopic worms. 
and uh, fungi. And basically what what they do is, and we're going to have actually a, another workshop that goes a little bit deeper into this, so I'm just going to kind of um, give you guys the basics. But what it does is that the nematodes and the protozoa, they prey on like bacteria. The bacteria is higher in certain types of nutrients than these guys want, and so it saturates them. And so then they pee and, you know, whatever else. Um, in the ground and that uh, all those nutrients then go to the roots that way and so we get kind of like what's called nutrient cycling um, and that's how you don't have to apply fertilizer um, and then you have fungi who also creates like symbiotic relationships with plants and they exchange nutrients and so you get all kinds of nutrient cycling that allows you to not have to have any kinds of fertilizers also if you have a healthy ecosystem then you can't uh, then you like are more resistant from like pests types of microbes and stuff like that, but we'll get a little bit further into it. Yeah. This, I, I've, I've like thought about it in a couple different ways and um, it's just dying. Um, so if you look on the back there, it's really bad. There's a point where they're just too far gone. I'd say like, you know, we can do some biological stuff to, um, to kind of like help mitigate and bring plants back from like disease, but this thing is like really, really far gone, rotted in the, in the core. He was talking about maybe trying to do something with the stump. Um, maybe you could uh, aesthetically, but there's not really, nothing I can think of. We're not taking that one down. Just that, that one's, right now it's okay. So maybe this, whatever we do here will help the, uh, the health of that tree. And these designs right now are not finalized. They're um, kind of just like concept designs. Um, I did design without that tree because there was mentioned that maybe that would come out too, but I can always um, kind of just do some modifications in the final design that includes that tree if it's gonna stay long-term. Um, yeah, but there's boulders incorporated into this too. There's different like layers, you know, considering people walking by, there's different places where your eyes can go. Um, I don't know if, you, if that's, that binder made it around to everybody, but these two are red buds, which are like really attractive shrubs. And so as you're walking by different, you know, your eyes have different places to go to different dimensions and layers and stuff. That's which, which is another kind of cool thing about nature scaping as opposed to like landscaping is all the different layers in, that we're gonna have that is really aesthetically attractive. Um, as well as, like I said, kind of just feeling and body wise attractive too, so. Um, do we have any other questions right now? Yeah. And you may be getting to this, so I hope. I'm, I'm pretty sure. much like, yeah, I mean. Well, I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit of, because uh, those of us on the landscaping committee have been part of this, but for a lot of people, this is new information. So maybe can you talk to just, or Allison, uh, maybe just a little bit to explain what the, what the benefit is of permaculture of landscaping versus the runoff that we have from the lawns right now, and as far as like how it's going to help with water saving costs over the long term and also be beneficial for the soil and, and get a little bit more into like what the sustainability yeah. of it is versus what we have right now so people can kind of wrap their hands and heads around it. Yeah, so I guess part of the... Um Part of the reason for switching to this type of system is that currently there's a lot of like high water usage demand for grass and lawns and stuff, um, which is expensive for one thing. It's also not very sustainable. Um, this system shouldn't need much watering once established. Um, there's a, there's multiple benefits, but that's, that being one of them. So again, we're capturing rainwater. Um, the biology that we're going to be putting into the ground also creates like structure in the soil um, over time. So you have each of these uh, microbes that I talked about, they each kind of serve a different function in creating structure in the soil. Um, a good way to think about it is like, you know, uh, clay ground, like this is really hard clay ground as you can, you can probably feel it, right? None of these legs are going into the ground or anything like that. Um, and that's because it's clay, but you have, um, what you have is you have like microbes, that, uh, bacteria, they'll start to separate the like platelets of clay and start to what's called flocculate it and move them apart. You have uh, the glues from bacteria that will start to like glue them together and start making what's called like micro aggregates. And then you have fungi that comes in and it takes those micro aggregates and they start making macro aggregates. 
and you start getting like this more like spongier type uh, soil, which is something you could really just take your hand and dig all the way down into your elbow, the structure changes. And that means that we can also store more water in the ground too. And the roots can get deeper and start act, you know, activating and getting more of the water that's in the ground as well. So all that combined would really cut down on like our, on the need for the water, uh, like supplemental irrigation. It also will provide like much more nutrients and health for the plants. So all the plants you see are going to be much more vibrant and big and just luscious and feel healthy. Whereas you might walk around and you see like gray in the grass or brown in the grass and you know, unhealthy looking plants, you know, dying tree. That stuff doesn't happen as much in a, in a natural ecosystem that we're trying to create here. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Allison? I'm not sure. No, no I, I think that's great. I think we say so often that healthy soil holds water, um, you know, in ways that you'll otherwise see it just running off into the street, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, by creating that healthy soil that can hold it, um, we'll have the water saving and we'll be having to apply fertilizer, yeah. pesticides, all the things that often get applied with yeah so just to summarize basically to capture and store water we have a number of methods one would be getting the water off of the rooftops um, channeling it into our basins which cap capture the water allow it to sink, sink into the ground um, and by having that structure, then all of that water can go into the ground and kind of stay there and water the plants longer term. Also, all that moisture also stays within the bodies of all these microbes too. So it's basically like, you know, just picture like little water balloons like all around. And when the plants need it, you know, something comes along and eats it and water balloon bursts and they got more water. So, so would we be able to turn off the system That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. Um, no, so to get it established, we'll need to do some supplemental irrigation. Um, it depends. So one of the things is that I guess like maybe uh, Roundup was used here, but maybe not, yes. not too long ago. Like years ago. We haven't used it in yeah, several so, years now. So for me, it's a little bit of a question mark on how long it's going to take for us to establish the biology. If, the, if there wasn't Roundup used, I could probably establish biology in like three applications. Um, it's in it's in the biology primer which I sent and maybe you guys have access to it um, but you think of it much like kind of like the Mayflower or any other like settlers right like they get to new land on this, this ship and maybe a few of them survive and they can kind of start establishing stuff and the next one comes and a couple more and all of a sudden like more come and more come and it starts to actually develop and become a society and it's kind of the same thing with the microbes so over time, like it will get established, but depending on how bad the roundup is, it may take like up to ten applications even to get it established here. So when you say applications, what do you mean? Yeah. So again, that's going to be more in the biology talk, but basically, um, for the soil, what we do is we do a compost extract, and it's not any kind of compost. Not all compost is created alike. Um, I use put, uh, very specific compost that I've looked at under a microscope, make sure it has all of the microbes that I want and the numbers that I need and in the ratios that I need. And then I scrub that compost um, under like water to get all those microbes off and into the water. And then I do compost extract applications into the soil. And that basically is inoculating the soil with those microbes. And then the, the plants and everything start to feed those microbes with the sugars um, that they get through photosynthesis. So what we're doing basically is we are capturing the sun's uh, energy through photosynthesis, taking that, creating carbon sugars for the biology. The biology is eating that and transforming it, and then they're doing this whole nutrient cycling. So it's a very natural process that we're trying to establish. <clears throat> yeah. Um, that's part of um, I think where we come in with supporting um, because we will be um, providing. Michael's first three applications, I think, right? Yes. To establish that biology as part of this project. So, oh, right away. No, right away. Yeah, no, because aside just from uh, doing the biology, there's also 
you know, in, the, in compost itself, it has a lot of nutrients from all the nutrient cycling that's been going on. So when I'm doing the extract, I'm also extracting a lot of humic acids, nitrogen, all kinds of stuff. And so the plants are going to react to it right away. We just put um, a post up with a little bio on Michael on the HOA page. And it has a photo slideshow from a garden that he's installed. And I, I mean, the photos are, are beautiful. And a lot of pollinators are in everything. And how old is that garden? It's like five months. OK. Uh, so that would be great to go look at because, yeah, it's Yeah, that's beyond my scope. We'll, we'll put it in front of your home. How's that? Um, we, we just have a land problem. Yeah, we have a land problem, but that we are thinking about that, of course. But you know, in Benicia, you can give your food scraps, right? In your yard bin, you know that. Right? So, yeah, real, real quick, one second. So and just to clarify again, not all compost is created equal. So that compost that they're doing, I mean, it's nice because you're at least, if you, if you go and get compost from somewhere else, you're at least getting like organic matter, which is nice to add, but unlikely that it has all the biology that we need. It's, it's like fungi in particular is really fickle to establish. Um, and, it, and it's critical. Fungi is like the most critical thing. When you hear people talk about how like their blueberries like acidic environments, the reason for that in a natural context is that they grow in like forests that have high fungal um, like ratio in the ground. And fungi um, produces nitrogen in an acidic way, whereas bact uh, bacteria produces nitrogen in a uh, alkaline way. And so a lot of the compost that you're going to find out there doesn't have that fungal component. And so they're going to be more um, bacteria dominant, which means you're going to get more alkaline compost, whereas we're getting more like acidic and we're trying to apply that to the ground to provide a balance for all the plants that want to thrive. So, yeah. Yeah, on this one, yeah, on this one, yeah, I'm, I was trying to, I need to see, I'm hoping that maybe there's some other ones that we can somehow connect and harvest it to into that same system because there's not a ton of water we're getting off of that small rooftop. If, if it's practical, depending on where the downspouts are. I mean, here it kind of makes sense. We can go underneath the, uh, the concrete there and get it to a point that makes sense. But here on the rooftop, you're going to get the runoff from the this half of the pitch roof as well onto the uh, the flat roof. If that's so true, I yeah, I didn't calculate that. Okay, yeah. so there's probably maybe a little bit more than whatever there that might be, yeah. that you mm -hmm. came up with. But you know, 400 gallons is a lot for <clears throat> irrigation. One inch, and for one inch of rain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, yeah, that, like those, the spots like this one over here, little. they're going to have so much, so much water, it's crazy. Yeah. So the other thing I want to, was there more than one? Um, I, no, I'm okay right now. Okay, yeah. can I add some things? Because I know some people were asking bigger picture questions. Like Jennifer, you had a question about how much irrigation is going to need initially. So the idea in the bigger picture in this next phase is to actually convert uh, all the shrub areas to drip. Because right now we're over watering and the water isn't getting where it's supposed to be going. And the soil is a big deal. And that's why we're really excited about partnering with these guys because you can see this landscaping here was done a few years ago. A lot of drought resistant landscaping, it all actually is, but they're not doing well because the soil is in such bad condition, you know, and it's getting worse and worse because of the, uh, the drought and so forth. So hopefully whatever we, uh, uh, you know, incorporate here and are successful with, we can eventually apply to the other areas as well. Um, as far as the bigger picture, again, we're going to start out with the larger lawn areas that are not directly in front of people's lawns. I think people still need to get more acquainted with the whole concept, and a lot of people aren't willing to give uh, their lawns you know, uh, away. So we're going to start with the larger lawn areas, like, for example, down on Stewart, that uh, long strip along the fence. 
that's all going to be converted to this type of landscaping, you know. And this made sense here. And then up on Devonshire, that one little peninsula area between, kind of on the, on the corner between the, the two guest parking areas, yeah. where there's two or three big trees, right there. I mean, there's no way we can maintain a lawn there. And you can see it's dying, so we're going to have to, we're going to incorporate this kind of landscaping there as well. And then other areas up there as well that are larger lawn areas. And then uh, ultimately, you know, it'll will transform the, the whole area. You know, so. Uh, yes, you know, we, we have the budget in the reserves. This is not an operational budget. It's in the reserves for all the phases we've done so far. Mm -hmm. Phase one was the uh, uh, big boulders and drought resistant plants and the rocks in between the driveways. We completed that. Just in those areas alone, we've actually saved in, in terms of water quite a bit because we, before we had maybe six, eight huge, you know, lawn sprinkler heads that were over watering, but things were dying in there because of the soil it was so bad. Uh, so, and we converted it all to drip. So it's like two, three, four, maybe a little drip lines in there. And then, so that was the first phase. Second phase is what we're doing here right now underneath the mailboxes. Um, that was important and that was done in conjunction with the mailboxes. We're trying not to irrigate the mailboxes. Because, uh, you know, they were getting, they were wearing down too quickly because of all the, you know, the, you know, Venetia has a lot of hard water, you know, and, and we could see it, you know, on the mailboxes. So that was really part of, um, and also fixing the irrigation. I mean, we're still dealing with a lot of the original irrigation lines from 18, 1982, if you can believe it, when this place was, was built. And this developer just didn't have any rhyme or reason. And we found some crazy things, believe me, in terms of the irrigation that we've actually had to fix just underneath the mailboxes. Yeah, so that phase two was that plus doing this site and the site up there is part of a pilot, a prototype area uh, for phase three. And then phase three next year will be the larger lawn areas where we really start to incorporate these, these concepts that I think are really going to change the whole environment, the whole ecosystem. And I, How far down are you going with the, um, the water? <coughs> with the basins? Yeah. They don't have to be that deep because we, we don't have like a ton of water to, to harvest. Um, also, uh, yeah, we're going to have, like I said, they're, they're going to be, should be pretty porous because of all the biology. So it should be able to um, percolate pretty fast. Right now, it wouldn't, obviously. It'll pond up right now. But once we have the biology going, it should be able to percolate pretty fast. Um, also, it's more, we're looking, you know, I don't want it to look like you've got, like, four pools or ponds here. We're really more looking for, like, natural three-dimensional curves that feel good and natural. Yeah. The only other thing is about butterflies. <clears throat> they also do, like, um, mud and little mud puddles. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and, and it's necessary for them. Unlikely, but luckily they got the marshes nearby. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's my memory is me right, but I think a long time ago, maybe like eight years, there was some kind of a government agency that was offering like a bounty for people to convert their areas into more, you know, uh, drought resistant thing. They were paying them like a dollar a square foot or some kind of a thing. Anybody else hear about that? He knows more about it. I know he was talking about it last time. Also, I think Sustainable Solano is a good resource for that too, because I think they also keep up on that type of stuff. Not, not me myself though. But it's just Venetia and the and the County Solano have a rebate. As as long as they still have the money is available. But it's it's limited. It's like yeah. a dollar a square foot up to about a thousand bucks. And that's that's about it. So <laughs> we are gonna look into that. So maybe we'll be able to get some reimbursements back from the city or the county. Yeah. You know, but it's it's a lot of effort because you got to get the county and the city involved from the get go. They got to take pictures, and it's a big deal. But we're gonna we're gonna follow up on that. No, no, no. We we're we're definitely gonna look into that. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as we get into the larger picture, we start doing the larger lawn areas. Then we'll get them involved for that. So. Yeah, I think that covers everything. Is there any other questions?
I would really encourage people also to look at the information um, that Allison mentioned about uh, Michael's project that he did, the Barts project, and also look at the sustainable Solano. Because I know that, like, looking at this picture and looking at the book, it's hard, difficult mm -hmm. to visualize sometimes what an overall um, landscaping like this area will look like. And so, um, sustainable Solano, and then also what um, Michael has put up with his garden project. They have, I mean, the ones on the sustainable Solano's website are like food gardens, so that's not exactly what we're doing, but there are some of the similar plants, so you can kind of visualize what they're going to look like over time, or, and there's a progression in some of them. And also, I know Allison has some garden installs coming up in Vacaville. Back, back Is there one coming up? Vacaville. Uh, yeah, in January. So yeah. We don't, yeah, we don't have dates that yet. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, there's going to be a lot of time between now and then, and that's how I found out about Sustainable Solano. And so you can learn about like the building of the swales and and how it actually how it's all done. It's super interesting and helpful in visualizing all of it. So I would just encourage you to look at those resources as well. So I sent you links on some of the letters that we sent out, but we'll post those links again, okay, along with this record. Hopefully this recording came out okay. Yeah, so, um, and also, you know, Michael's going to be involved with the design process to some extent, yes. right, here and up there. So he'll be around for further education. You know, if yeah. you have any questions and try to get ideas for your backyards and so forth. So yeah, my information is on the, the handout too. So and in general, um, I have two areas that like I specialize in aside from like rainwater catchment and biology, but it's uh, like food forests, so more edible landscapes. Um, and then uh, this more like native kind of thing too. So yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great.